I greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I trust that you are keeping well. It is a great privilege for me this morning to be able to share the Word of God with you. And I pray that we will be blessed as we fellowship together. Uh, this morning's Bible reading comes to us from the book of John chapter 6, verses 1 through to verse 14. Just before we read those verses together, shall we bow our heads as we pray for God's blessing. Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you this morning for the gift of life, for your love and for your faithfulness. We realize that we can do nothing without you and so we are praying for your Holy Spirit to lead, to guide us, to understand your word and your will for our lives. I pray now, Lord, that you will pour out your Spirit in full abundance and that all that is said and done will bring praise, glory and honor to your name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. The book of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through to 14, says to us, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, saying, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a young boy here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, and so the men sat down, in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. And so when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. One of the most well-known acts or miracles of Jesus is the feeding of the 5,000. Yet, as with everything else in the New Testament, this story doesn't occur without a context or without a bigger picture. That helps us to understand even more deeply the meaning of what Jesus had done. And so within the context of John chapter 6, we find that John the Baptist had just been beheaded. This devastating incident was very discouraging for the disciples of Jesus, and it put their faith to the test. However, through this miracle of feeding the 5,000 plus people, Jesus sought to strengthen and grow the disciples' faith by demonstrating his creative power as well as authenticating his divinity. Interestingly enough, both creative miracles of Jesus turning water into wine in, in Cana as well as the multiplying of bread here in John chapter 6, speak of the main elements of the Lord's Supper or the communion service. Large groups of people follow Jesus not out of belief, but purely out of curiosity uh, concerning the miracles that he performed. However, in spite of the crowd's motivations or motives, Jesus had compassion on them, healed their sick, and now sought to feed them. If anyone knew where to find or to get food, it would have been Philip, because he was from the area, he was from Bethsaida, a town just a few kilometers away. In asking where shall we buy bread that these may eat, Jesus was testing Philip to strengthen his faith. Philip started assessing the probable cost. The initial problem faced by the disciples seemed insurmountable. A crowd of thousands looking for food. And, and this group wasn't going to go away. They were not going to leave. And there was not enough money to feed everyone. And all they could solicit was barely enough to feed one boy. Philip was so focused on the crowd that he seemed to forget who was standing next to him. By asking for a human solution, knowing there was none, Jesus highlighted the powerful and miraculous act that he was about to perform. Jesus wanted to teach not only Philip, but the, but, but the other disciples as well, that financial resources are not the most important ones. 
We can at times limit what God does in us by assuming what is and is not possible. Is there some impossible task that you believe God wants you to do? Don't let your estimate of what can't be done keep you from taking on the task. God can do the miraculous. Trust him to provide the resources. In response, Jesus miraculously provides not just a solution, but an abundance more than was needed to solve the problem. The disciples here in John 6 are contrasted with the young boy who willingly gave what he had. The disciples certainly had more resources than the young boy, but they thought that they did not have enough, and so they chose not to give anything at all. The young boy gave what little he had, and it made all the difference. He was willing to share his lunch that his mom had packed for him that morning. The disciples' money seemed impossibly limited. The boy's lunch seemed impossibly small. And yet in the hands of Christ, what seemed small and insignificant became so abundant that people had to be careful not to waste the leftovers. If we offer nothing to God, he will have nothing to use. But he can take what little we have and turn it into something great if we will but surrender it in faith. Our insufficiency is made sufficient in Christ. In performing this miracle, Jesus usually preferred to work through people. Here he took what a young boy offered and used it to accomplish a great miracle. Age is no barrier. To Christ and never think that you are too young or too old to be of service to him. The boy may have thought to himself, if only I had brought more fish and more bread, or at least if I had brought something better than this. Beloved, little did the young boy know that little is much in the hands of God. What courage, what faith the young boy expressed. Surely in the boy's eyes, as well as in the eyes of all the others, the supply was absolutely inadequate. And yet to Christ, our inadequacy makes room for his sufficiency. The young boy had choices to make. He could have kept what he had out of a sense of shame. Everyone will know how poor I am. He may have said in his mind, barley loaves. How can these be worthy of anyone, let alone Jesus? Uh, beloved, there are those who hold back from a full surrender to God, often because they feel unworthy that, that others will judge them or mock them. But the Bible reminds us in the book of Romans 3 verse 23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None are righteous, no, not one. The boy could have remained quiet out of a sense of selfishness. He could have said, this is my lunch. I made sure that I brought something and I needed for myself to sustain me throughout the day. Yet apparently the young boy without hesitation, without reservation, stepped up to Jesus and gave him the five loaves and the two fish. Here we find that the young boy was exercising an act of faith. Now let me be clear, friends. The Greek word translated faith throughout the Bible is not a noun. It is a verb. And as a verb, it requires action. There is no faith in the Christian walk without action. A better description of faith would be faithing. The widow we find in the Old Testament gave the prophet Elijah the last fragment of food she had. She did it by faithing. David walked down into the valley to face the giant Goliath with, with, with only a sling in his hand. He did it by faithing. The widow gave her last two mites into the temple treasury. She did it by faithing. Faith without action is not, nor has it ever been, a Christian faith. As James puts it in the book of James 2.26, faith without works is a dead faith. And so we each need to step out and give of ourselves. And when we do, we will be amazed at what God will do at our faith thing, putting our faith into action. What amazement the boy must have experienced that day. Jesus took the loaves and after giving thanks, the Bible says he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and they in turn gave it to the great multitude. In this, we see a clear illustration of the method 
in which all of God's greatest gifts have been spread throughout the world. One person faithing, putting their faith into action. One person faithing to another. And so John called special attention to the breaking of the bread. The breaking of the bread, this miracle, is a prelude or a foretaste to the Lord's Supper. When we bring to Jesus what we have and allow him to possess all of who we are, then the movement of God, the church of God, the kingdom of God will exceed our greatest expectations. Now, Jesus does something quite strange. After he feeds the multitude, he commands the disciples to do something. And notice here that Jesus in the book of John 6 verses 12 and 13 commands them to gather the fragments that remain. Now the question arises, why gather the fragments? Why is this gathering of the fragments even mentioned in this account? Now some have used, some have used this verse to teach us to be good stewards of what God gives us and not to waste it. And that is certainly true within the context. Uh, but there is another uh, possible reason why God requested the disciples to go and gather the fragments. You would note that the Bible says, and so when they were filled, the word when implies that something more had to be done beyond meeting the immediate needs. In the natural, they were gathering bread for the next day, but Jesus wanted them to take note of how much remained. The fragments that remained were many times greater than the original five loaves. There was something much deeper and more enduring that God wanted to reveal to them and accomplish in their hearts. Most of the time, after we finish a meal, there is food left over and we take what is left in the pot and put it in smaller containers and into the fridge. The next day or two, we have what we call leftovers either for lunch or for supper. Sometimes in a restaurant, we ask for a doggy bag. We take home a fragment, a piece or a portion of what we ate because we could not finish it. This is why Jesus sent his disciples around after everyone ate enough to gather up the fragments that remain. Jesus knew that someone, somewhere, at some time, at some point, would be hungry tomorrow. Jesus' instructions clearly indicates the purpose was not garbage collection, but gathering together something that was valuable and had an ongoing purpose. These fragments, these broken pieces, were enough to satisfy other hungry men and women. There were possibilities in the fragments which none saw but Jesus. In essence, Jesus was really saying, gather up the fragments in order that not a thing perish. Now, why gather up the fragments? I want to share with you three lessons. Jesus requested the disciples to gather up the fragments for three reasons. Number one, to remind them of the miracle that had taken place. You know, I'm sure that the disciples must have been wondering as they were distributing the food, will there be any food left over for me? And yes, each one of them would receive a full basket load. Picking up the fragments and placing them into a basket is likened unto counting your many blessings and naming them one by one. Whenever you find yourself troubled, you need to remember how many times Christ has provided for you in the past. And like the song says, and it, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. We are to take every experience we have with God and collect them together so that it becomes meaningful for the future and a reserve for future needs and growth. In every new circumstance, need or crisis that we face, we can draw on our past experiences with God to give us faith and courage in order to enable us to deal with our current situation. One of the sure signs that we are failing to gather up the fragments that remain is if every time we face new difficulties, we question God's faithfulness. Also, we will find ourselves constantly seeking new confirmations and new signs to prove that God is still with us. A spiritually minded Christian will seek to grow in Christ through every experience they have with God. They will hear God say, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. They will go beyond looking at God's hand of provision to seeking his face and knowing his person. 
Jesus wanted his disciples to take note of God's faithfulness that transcended anything they had ever understood or even imagined. He wanted his disciples to be filled, not just with bread, but with our powerful, wonderful and mighty God is. Jesus requested his disciples to gather up the fragments to number two, to reinforce their mission. Now, what is the mission of the church? The answer is both the gathering of and the giving of fragments. God wants us to use the fragments of our time, of our talents, of our finances and resources to grow and to build his kingdom. The fragments of time, the minutes, the hours, the days to Jesus was very precious and he did not let any of it go to waste. The day was never long enough for Jesus to exhaust. He gathered up every fragment of time by using it to be about his father's business. Even so, a person wasting time throws away not the time itself only, but the opportunities and privileges which that time represents. We that have grown older realize more than ever how precious the time we have left is. And so we need to take advantage of it by using it wisely in carrying out the Great Commission. The dearest of all to Jesus were the broken lives of men and women. And this was the passion of his heart, that nothing be lost. The world was and still is full of such fragments. Mary Magdalene, whose reputation had been shattered and fragmented by sin. And so we find that Jesus gathered the fragments and restored it to a place of honor and purity by his mighty love and grace. Paul the Apostle knew the depths of sin, but he also knew the height and the width of the love of God. And herein is the first aspect of our mission as a church. We need to go into our communities and gather up the fragments. We realize today that Satan has done the work of breaking lives into bits and pieces through gratification of sinful desires. As a church, we need to gather these pieces and place them into the basket of the local church. It is the purpose of the church to bring broken lives to Christ. Only he can make them whole again. Only he can restore them physically, emotionally and spiritually. It is also the purpose of the church to feed the spiritually hungry. Within a couple of chapters of today's text, a Gentile woman comes and begs for crumbs from the Jewish table. Before the event of John 6, before the event of feeding the 5,000, the disciples had nothing to give. Following this event, they had a full basket to share with others. God didn't give you a full basket to hoard it for yourself. God wants you to give some crumbs to those who are in great need, to those who are in desperation. In gathering of the fragments as a church body, we learn that the true mission of the church uh, is to gather those whose lives have been broken by sin and to be an instrument in restoring them back to God. The third reason why God requested his disciples to gather the fragments was to reveal to them the manna from heaven, the true bread of life. Now, where did this food come from? Uh, just as in the day of Moses, it came from heaven. The Bible tells us in the book of James that every good and perfect gift comes from above. If we are to receive anything, it will be from the hand of God. And so we find here that God miraculously intervenes and provides an abundant supply of food for the multitude. Gather up the fragments. The Greek word for gather up also has the meaning of bringing things together to join together, to join in one of those things that we previously separated. The fragments by themselves were just small pieces of bread, but, to, but put together, they made up much more. The bread they ate fulfilled their immediate need, but the fragments of the bread when collected together were tomorrow's provision and represented the continued overflow of the grace and power of God for the future. The fragments provided more than leftovers. They brought joy just remembering God's supernatural provision and faithfulness. Those present would carry that memory with them for the rest of their lives. The bread they ate provided for their immediate needs. However, if they chose to remember, dwell on and meditate on God's faithfulness, the bread would feed them for a lifetime. 
The book of John 6.33 says, For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. In Psalms 103, David provides a wonderful pattern of how to gather the fragments so that nothing is lost. In Psalm 103 verses 1 to 7, David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And so King David, in essence, is saying that we gather the fragments of God's providence by giving testimony to God's faithfulness. We gather the fragments of worship by giving thanks to God in prayer and praise. We gather the fragments of scripture by meditating upon his word and applying it in our daily battles. We gather up the fragments of our time as we use it productively and wisely to grow and expand the kingdom of God. We gather up the fragments of our resources as we give generously, holding nothing back. Imagine the great impact of the young boy's generosity. He gave Jesus five loaves and yet there were 12 baskets of leftovers. He would remember what Jesus did with his small meal for the rest of his life. Look at what God can do when we give him everything. To make the study personal, I feel that there are many that have a few leftovers who need to be sharing them with others. In the book of Amos 8.11, it speaks of a famine. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the word of God. The world, friends, is facing moral starvation. Someone needs to stand up and tell the world, I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm saved. I have tasted the bread of life, and I have a testimony to share. In fact, I have some fragments of my experience with Jesus that I would like to share with you. You may have heard a sermon which made an impact in your life. You need to share that with somebody. A past camp meeting experience, a Bible study that you may have attended. If you remember them and, and it has impacted in your life, then you need to share it with someone. You may say to yourself this morning, that was a long time ago and the bread that I received then is stale and, and hard by now. Bring it to Jesus. Put it back into his hands and it will feed a multitude. This bread never becomes stale. It is eternal. You may say that I am too old or there have been too many things that have happened in my life that I cannot feed anyone. Bring your life, bring your thoughts and your experience to Jesus. Put it all into his hands and the leftovers will become food for some hungry soul. There is a hungry world at your feet, friends. They need to be fed with the manna from heaven. May God use our lives to provide spiritual manna to those who are so desperately in need of it. God is still friends in the business of performing miracles and wonders in our lives. And all it takes is a heart of faith for God to intervene and to do what is humanly impossible to do. Ellen G. White says that we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget how the Lord has led us in the past. I pray that as we contemplate on John 6, that we will keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Shall we pray together? Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you for speaking to us through your word. Thank you for reminding us that when we give the little we have to you, that you can do great things with it. And so may you help us, Lord, to gather up the fragments of our lives, that nothing be lost that everything be salvaged for your glory and for your kingdom. We pray, dear God, for the many who are listening uh, to this message, praying, Lord, that you will intervene in each of their lives. And just as you performed a miracle uh, here for the great multitude, we pray that you will continue to perform miracles and wonders in each of our lives. We pray, dear God, that you may watch over us 
and that you may continue to supply our, both our physical and spiritual needs. We want to place now our feeble hands into your mighty hands, praying that your spirit may continue to abide with each one. It's my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.